calling all cars. The copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Receiving hospital, we listen in on one of the constant series of emergency calls. A man's been run over by a street car at the corner of 8th and Hill Street. He'll die unless help gets here quick. How fast can you get a doctor here? 8th and Hill Street? The ambulance is on its way now, and being in two minutes or less. And so it happens hundreds of times a day in the many cities and counties where Rio Grande cracks gasoline, powers the ambulances and emergency cars. As the call for help is coming over the phone, the ambulance driver is signaled and steps on his starter. The engine roars instantly into full power. No choking, no delay. With clutch out, the driver awaits the address. And even as the location is given him over the loudspeaker, he is rounding the corner with Rio Grande cracked gasoline pouring power into the rear wheel. More power, more speed, more acceleration than ordinary gasoline can give. That's the reason more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, motorcycles, and all other emergency equipment are powered by Rio Grande Crack than any other gasoline everywhere it is sold. Because it is manufactured in America's newest, finest cracking plant by the most advanced process and most costly equipment known to the petroleum industry. Rio Grande Crack has the advantage over all other gasoline. It costs more to make Rio Grande Crack, but it costs you no more and if you will use it in your car, you too will enjoy police car performance. And now it is our pl- pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. When the bootlegging racket was abolished by repeal. The organized gangs of criminals in this country turn to the snack racket as the next easiest way of making a dishonest livelihood. We had an epidemic of kidnapping. Wealthy people were in constant fear. Many employed bodyguards. Then the law enforcement agencies of the country arose in mass to crush out this new threat to law-abiding citizens. They succeeded so well that practically every kidnapping mystery has been solved and the culprits placed behind the bars with good stiff sentences to serve. I am proud to point out that every major kidnapping case originating in Los Angeles has been promptly broken by the police. The infamous Hickman case, the ghetto kidnapping, all were sensations for a few days. And then the detectives closed in, and it was all over. I cannot conceive of any criminal mind being stupid enough to try again in view of the failures of these other carefully planned attempts. But if anyone listening tonight thinks he is smart enough to get away with a kidnapping, I ask him to listen now and learn how we crack the steel kidnapping. Tonight's dramatization is based on the famous Steele kidnapping case. The kidnapping of Mrs. Mary Steele outraged the citizenry of Los Angeles as no crime had since the infamous Hickman case. On a Sunday evening several years ago, Walter Fisher Steele, dean of the music school at the University of Southern California, as was his custom, left for the church where he played the organ. Shortly after his departure, Mrs. Steele, all alone in the house, was summoned to the telephone. Hello? Is that Mrs. Steele? Yes. Are you alone? Yes. I don't want to frighten you, Mrs. Steele. Why, well, what's the matter? This 
to the emergency hospital. Yes, yes, I did. My husband? Yes. Is he? He's been injured in a traffic accident, Mrs. Steele. Oh. He's not in danger. Oh, thank heaven. But the doctor thinks it's best for you to come over here. Yes, yes, of course. We'll send a car for you. Very well. I'll get ready right away. Thank you, Mrs. Steele. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, poor Walter. I should have asked you how it happened. Now, now, where did I leave my hat? Oh, yes. And my coat. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, I, I must call Franklin. Oh, why don't I put that, that coat? That doesn't slip out. I must, I must mend that lining. Now, now, let's see. What is Franklin's number? Oh, yes, I remember. Oh, dear, dear. Poor Walter. Oh. Hello, Franklin. Hello, Mother. Franklin, something terrible has happened. What's the matter, Mother? Oh, Franklin, your father's been hurt. Hurt? How? What happened? I don't know. They just called me from the hospital. They said it was a traffic accident. What hospital, Mother? The emergency hospital. They're sending someone over for well, me. Well, I'll leave here right away and meet you at the emergency hospital. All right, Franklin. And, and don't worry, Mother. No, no, I'll, I'll try not to, son. There's the bell. That must be the man from the hospital. Hurry over there, Franklin. I will, Mother. Goodbye. Goodbye, son. Is he? Oh. Is he all right? Yes, ma'am. He's resting very well. Is it serious? Well, I really don't know much about it. I'm just naughty. Are you ready, ma'am? Yes, I, I think I've got everything. Let's see. Oh, oh yes, my, my glasses. All right, now. You can go now. This is the nurse, Miss Wells, ma'am. Maybe she knows more about it. How do you do, Mrs. Steele? Tell me. Is he badly hurt? Uh, we don't think so, Mrs. Steele, but we wanted you to be with him. Where, where did the accident happen? We don't know. He, he was unconscious when they brought him in. Unconscious? Yes, but there are no serious fractures. Oh, that means. Really Look here. Where are you taking me? This isn't the way to the hospital. It's the way we're going. Let me out of here. You're not taking me to the hospital? Shut up, shut up. Now listen, Mrs. Scale. You're going for a ride with us. And if you know what's good for you, you won't make any noise or cause any trouble. Failing to find his father at the emergency hospital, Franklin Scale rushes to the church. There he discovers his father at the organ. Fearfully, they return together to the Scale home. I can't understand it, Franklin. Well, somebody must be playing a joke on you. One of the students, perhaps. It's rather a grisly joke. It doesn't look as old mother's home. Here, Father. Let me open the door. Your hand's shaking, sir. Well, the house is dark. Oh, Mary? Mary? Let me switch on the light. There. That's better. Franklin. Franklin, she's not here. Oh, don't get excited, Father. Oh, hello, what's this? What? Oh, a letter. Here, stuck under the door. It's addressed to you. It says on the envelope, Walter Fisher Skeel. If ever there was a time to be careful, it is now. Oh, here, here. Uh, let me have it. I haven't ten thousand dollars or anywhere near that much money. What are you going to do? I'm going to call the police. A short while later, Mr. Steele and his son are explaining the circumstances of Mrs. Steele's disappearance to Detective Lieutenant Paul D. Pittman and E.B. Copycat and Chief of Detective Joe Taylor. And that's that's all we know about it. Let me see that letter, please, Mr. Steele. Thank you. Read it aloud, Pittman. It says each move of yours will be watched closely. If you make one false move, it'll be just too bad for yourself and wife. You know, others have tried to be slick and let the officers know, but they've always paid off in flowers afterwards. $10,000 in cash or the wife pays the bill. 
This money must be of the denominations of $5, $10, $20 bills. None of these bills to be new. Place this money in paper sack and put inside a pasteboard box. Be sure this money is in the box for delivery. No dummy packages go. You will hold it until we know that you have followed these instructions. Your wife will not be returned if you have the money marked or the serial taken. You have new bills instead of used ones. You have any other denominations of bills instead of $5, $10, or $20. You have anyone with you or around you or following you. You talk of this to anyone. You notify the police or anyone else. Oh, do you, you think I did wrong and the wrong thing in coming to you? Absolutely not, Mr. Steele. That's what we're here for. Oh, I hope they, do. they don't do her any harm. Well, we had to come to the police, Father. You certainly couldn't have paid the ransom. This appears to be the work of amateurs. The ransom letter is not worded as it would be if written by experienced kidnappers. I think you may expect Mrs. Steele back safely. Well, I leave it all to you. We've We've given you all the information we have. We can only wait and hope. Let me ask you, Mr. Steele. Can you think of any enemies who may have done this out of vengeance? I know. I, I have no enemies. How about students? Is there anyone who has a grudge against you, perhaps because you failed him? Oh, but that's so silly. No, Mr. Steele. People do strange things for very strange reasons, as we quickly find out in this business. Now, could you think of any students who may have cause to hate you? Why, no, I, I really can't. Well, father's always had the respect of his students. Let's see that letter, Pittman. Yes, sir. You'll notice, Chief, that although the letter is typewritten, the word wife, whenever it appears, has been cut out of a newspaper or a magazine and pasted into the letter. Yeah, so it has. Hand me that magnifying glass over there, will you? Yes. Here you are, sir. Thanks. Hmm, the word daughter seems to have been originally typed into this letter. Have you any daughters, Mr. Steele? Yes, one. Does she live with you? No. Well, then, this letter must have been intended originally for the family of another victim. We haven't had any attempt kidnappings recently, have we, Copycat? No, sir, not for some weeks. Mm-hmm. Mighty strange. Hey, look here, sir. The envelope this letter came in. The name Walter Fisher Skeel has also been clipped from some printed matter and pasted on the envelope. That may be a lead. Yes, that's right. Mr. Steele. Uh, yes, Mr. Taylor. Do you recognize the printing here? Have you, uh, have you any idea where your name may have been printed? Uh, that the kidnappers could have found it? Well, well, no, I, I don't know. Of course, they, they print my name sometimes in the church bulletin. I see. And occasionally it's mentioned in the papers. But well, this isn't newsprint. Then in various notices at the university. I see. Well, I'll bet that's the source. Somebody at the university. Copy, Dick. You and Pittman get out there first thing in the morning and see if you can run down this printing. At the university, Detectives Copy, Dick, and Pittman are given the utmost cooperation by the sympathetic colleagues of Mr. Steele. They interview Mr. Cleo Foster, Assistant Superintendent of Buildings. Mr. Foster, you can be of great assistance to us. I'll do anything I can. Well, look closely at this printing here. Can you tell us whether it's similar to any type you use here in the university? Hmm. Let me hold this closer to the light here. Why, yes. That was clipped from one of our university bulletins. It's the only publication we print in which that particular typeface is used. Now, we're getting someplace. Maybe. Here, I'll show you what I mean. Here's the pamphlet, and here on page 11, see? Walter Fisher Steele, A.B., Dean of the College of Music, Professor of pi- Piano and Pipe Organ. See? The type is identical. Yeah, it sure is. Well, that much is plain. Somebody connected with the university wrote that ransom note. Yeah. And all we have to do is to find out the guilty person among 7,000 students. Scores of Mrs. Steele's relatives and friends are questioned by investigating officers. Inquiry is made among Dr. Steele's students at the university. And nowhere can a possible enemy of either husband or wife be found. Early Monday afternoon, Chief Taylor lays out the only plan of action open to the officers. Well, we'll have to appear to meet the demands of the kidnappers. We'll take them their ransom as the note directs. But, Chief, I, I haven't that much money. That's all right, Mr. Steele, I know. 
We'll make a dummy package. And at 5.30, we'll take it in full view on the seat of your car to the spot they indicate on Montecito Drive. But they expressly said in the note that dummy packages would do no good. Yes, I know that's all right. But we will have officers with high-powered field glasses staked out around the place watching. Watching whoever picks up the money. Then we can follow him. Oh, I see. Pardon, Chief. Yes, Lieutenant Romero? One of the reporters beat us to it. What do you mean? He's been up on Montecito Drive and he picked up the plan. What? Bring him in here. Hey, Eddie. Come on in here. The chief wants to see you. Hello, Chief. Well, I made a great... Look here, Eddie. I gave orders to stay away from that place. Yeah, but I'm not under the orders for you. I got a chance for a scoop and I took it. Yes, and probably up to the whole state house. What did you find? See, this box is in the bank where the letter said it would be. But it had this note in it. It says, walk to the left across street to bank. Here will be final instructions. We like tricks, but prefer to keep them out of business. Then across the street, I found this note attached to this cord. This note says, tie package salary to this end of string and go on. There's about 250 yards of string. Well, here. you sure are a great help, Eddie. You don't said you. You probably scared them away now and spoiled our whole plan. Romero? Yes, sir. Take these things back up there on Montecito. Yes, sir. And you go with him, Eddie, and show him exactly how you found them. Okay, Chief. Appointed time, Mr. Steele drives to the top of Montecito Drive with Detective Copycat clamped into the rumble seat of his car. He deposits the dummy ransom bundle and drives on. Early that evening, Copycat reports to his chief. Well, Copycat, what luck? None. Mr. Steele delivered the package. There wasn't anyone around. The men stayed on the stake up until it was too dark to see through their binoculars. And they pulled the stake. Didn't see a thing, eh? Uh. Looks like we're up a blind alley until the kidnappers make the next move. Yes, it does look that way. We've done all we possibly can. And look at these papers. Howling for action from the police. As though we haven't been doing anything else but acting for the last 24 hours. Well, I don't know. Haven't been to bed yet. Well, most of the other boys. If I could only get my hands on the rat that snatched that harmless, frail little woman, I would. Detective Bureau, Chief Taylor speaking. Yeah. All right. We'll be right out. What's that, Chief? That was Steele. Mrs. Steele just came home. Come on, Ed. We're going to get someplace now. Exhausted and upset as she is, Mrs. Steele pluckily recites the story of her experiences at the hands of the kidnappers to an innocent audience of detectives. And when I screamed... He put his hand over my mouth and shut off my breath. I had almost gotten the door open. Then the woman stopped the car, and they tied a cloth over my eyes so I couldn't see. I fought them until my strength was exhausted. Is that where you got your face scratched, Mrs. Steele? Yes. And that's the only time they were rough with me. They told me that if I didn't cry out or make trouble, that they wouldn't harm me. So I agreed. We, we sort of made a bargain. Did you describe the man and woman who kidnapped you? Well, I... I didn't get a very good look at the girl, but the man was stockily built. He was of, of medium height, shorter than Mr. Steele, and, and he had a ruddy complexion. He, he really was a nice young man, and he treated me very well. I, I, uh, what, Mrs. Steele? Well, I, I told him I wouldn't double-cross him. But I feel somehow that in telling you gentlemen about him, that perhaps I, I'm doing just that. You can't double-cross a criminal, ma'am. You owe this man nothing. It's your duty to help us put him in the penitentiary, if possible. Well, if, if what I can tell you will do any good in saving other innocent people from such an experience, I guess then it is for the best. Of course it is, Mrs. Steele. Now, tell us, Mrs. Steele, did they feed you at all while you were in the house? Oh, yes. This morning I had some coffee and prunes for breakfast, and this afternoon they gave me a bowl of tomato soup. They wanted me to eat more, but, but I wasn't hungry. I was so excited. No, not really. You, uh... You haven't told us how you managed to get away. Oh, well, that was very strange. This afternoon, my guard announced that he would take me home tonight. And so we left that house about 7 o'clock, and he drove me within two blocks of my own house. I walked home from there. Oh, oh yes, sir. But then he told me that he needed money badly. 
and that I could try to raise $5,000 for him. He said he'd call in a few days and say that it was Mr. Smith, so I'd know who was calling. Hmm. That's a strange way of raising money. Well, that's the amateur's case. That's my opinion. Now, mm-hmm. Mrs. Skill. Oh, please, if you don't mind. I'm very tired. Perhaps tomorrow I can remember some more details. Yes, that's of course, Mrs. Skill. Please forgive us for keeping you so long tonight after all you've been through. questioning of Mrs. Steele the next day brings to light a little information regarding the layout of the house in which she was held captive. Although blindfolded, she remembers the position of the bed and other furniture in the room where she was detained. She recalls hearing children playing outside, the chiming of a clock, the purr of passing traffic, a distant train. But such clues are all too meager. Telephone messages regarding persons whose actions might be suspicious flood the detective bureau and Chief Taylor's staff is kept busy running them down. Then, late in the day, an important piece of information comes to them. Very well, ma'am. We'll have a man right out there. Yes. Thank you for calling. I beg pardon, Chief, but there's a young lady outside who's got a story I think you'd better hear. What's it about? Kidnapping. Come to room. Yes, sir. Will you step this way, please? Miss Smith, this is Chief Taylor. Oh. How do you do, sir? How do you do, Miss Smith? Won't you please be seated? Oh, uh, thank you. Now, uh, what can we do for you? Well, I, I guess I should have reported it before this, but a man and a woman tried to kidnap me. When was it? Now, let me see. It was on January 27th. I see. you mind telling us just how it happened? Well, on the evening of the 27th, a man telephoned and said he was Mr. Johnson, one of my father's parishioners. Father's a minister, you know. I see. And this man said that one of Daddy's church classes was planning a surprise party for Daddy. He wanted me to accompany him and his wife to the home of one of the church members and, and help plan the party. Yes? Well, I, I said I'd be glad to. And, and a while later, he called for me. His wife was in the car. He introduced himself and his wife. And, and then just as I was getting into the car, I... Uh, well, it sounds kind of funny to say it now, but I, I noticed that his mustache was false and that it was slipping. So I pulled away from him and I ran back onto the porch and the car drove away just as fast. Well, what does this man look like? Well, I... I really didn't get a very good look at him except to notice in the stash because... Sounds I... like the same couple, Romero. Mm. And that would explain the ransom note which originally read daughter. That's right. If this gang is up on kidnapping, it won't be long before we have another mystery on our hands. We've just got to get them, that's all. Detective Bureau, Chief Taylor speaking. Yes? What's that number? Wait a minute, where do I write that down? All right. We look into that. Thank you. It was a mail carrier. He suggested a house at this number on Montecito Drive might bear watching. Here's the number on you, Romero. You better hop out there and take a look at it. Yes, sir. Now, Miss Smith, if you kindly answer a few more questions regarding this attempted kidnapping, I... Montecito Drive. What block is that on, Copy Tech? The 1100 block. Hey, Will, that was it. We just passed it. Pull up here. Hey, Ed, look. Montecito Drive winds up the hill. See, it switches back above us. Yeah. Don't you see right up there above us? That's the place where the ransom plant was. Say, sure it is. Well, the end of that cord comes within 50 yards of the back of that house. For the first time in there, we're getting warm. Let's get up there on that porch and see if we can do business. Somebody moving around inside. Here they come. What do you want? We're investigating a kidnapping case. I don't know anything about a kidnapping case. Just a minute, if you don't mind. We'd like to come in and talk with you. Well, all right. It won't do you any good, but you can come in. Well... What's your name? Georgia Price. Age? 
28. How long has he lived here? Two months. And before that? In Long Beach. Hmm. Can you give us the names of some Long Beach people who are acquainted with him? What for? So we can complete our report, Miss Hammer. What's that? I said Miss Hammer. I told you my name is Price. You live here alone? Yes. Well, then why is there mail here addressed to the Well of Pearl Hammer? Why, well, I, I... Never mind. Copy check, do you smell something familiar? Like, say, pipe tobacco smoke? Yeah, I believe I do. All right, come out of there, you. What's your name? Howard. W.D. Howard. You shouldn't smoke your pipe while your girlfriend here is entertaining the police. Ah, uh, you take a lot for granted. Maybe. You leave that pipe alone. Why? Oh. Oh, so you don't know anything about a kidnapping, huh? Well, how does it happen that you have Mrs. Mary Skeel's name, address, and telephone number written down here in your purse? And then right above it, Miss Isabel Smith. Now, you didn't do so good on that little job either, did you? Too bad your boyfriend here let his mustache slip. Hey, you uh, were... Quiet, you. The less talking you do now, the better for you. And here's a phone bill for a house on Buckeye Street in Pasadena. Made out to you. What's the meaning of that? My mother used to own that house. I haven't been there for several months. Still, the bill is dated January the 10th, 1935. Come on. Get on your hats and coats. You're going to the police station. <laughs> on Buckeye Street revealed damning evidence. The prune pits from Mrs. Steele's breakfast and the soup can from her lunch were found there. The typewriter, which was proved to have written the ransom note, was discovered in a trunk. Mrs. Steele, taken to the house and blindfolded, recognized the room where she was held captive by touching the furniture. Bit by bit, the case was built by the clever detective work of Chief Taylor's men. Howard arrogantly maintained his innocence until he was faced with his police record under his real name of E. M. Van Dorn, which showed he had served a term in San Quentin for forgery. And then he broke down and admitted his guilt, but pled for the freedom of Miss Hammer. The girl, faced with the confession of Van Dorn, alias Howard, also confessed. Later, at her trial, she pled insanity, and attempted to back her plea by feigning madness in the courtroom. But the jury was unimpressed and found her guilty of kidnapping. Van Dorn pled guilty, and both of the culprits were sentenced to from 10 years to life. Van Dorn at San Quentin, Miss Hammer at the new prison for women at Tehachapi. Thank you, Chief Davis. <laughs> Hundreds of letters are received every day by the Rio Grande Oil Company from boys and girls who want to join Rio Grande's junior police department. To these young people, Rio Grande has distributed three, several hundred thousand police badges, Sam Brown uniform belts and pistols, handcuffs, detective microscopes, and fingerprint outfits. Fifteen free gifts in all. Get the latest copy of the Calling All Cars News. It's free wherever Rio Grande cracks gasoline is sold, and read all about the Rio Grande junior police department. And while you're in the Rio Grande station, check your oil. If you're due for a drain, we ask you to try Sinclair motor oil. The oil in Sinclair tamper-proof cans is millions of years old, yet it's the finest oil on the market, refined to meet the needs of the new high-compression motors. You'll find your motor is quieter with Sinclair motor oil, and your car runs smoother, faster, because all wax and useless petroleum jelly is removed to leave only pure oil that lasts longer and never fails to give perfect lubrication. Rio Grande guarantees you'll be satisfied with Sinclair Pennsylvania or Sinclair Opaline motor oil. Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company.